transportation is really important. At some level, when we issued our congestion report at the Massachusetts Department of Transportation a couple of months ago, um, it wasn't newsworthy in the sense that we sort of said, you know, congestion is so bad it's reached a tipping point. And anyone who um, drives in this state already knew that, right? So, but the reason that I think it's important and where I want to spend some time this morning talking is that um, if we could develop from the planning work that we've already done um, over the last four years, if we can develop a shared understanding of what's going on and what the causes of the challenges at the MBTA and the congestion on our roads and the ever increasing uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with the transportation sector, if we can all agree on that, then we can have a great policy conversation about how we're going to solve those. Um, but you can't get a policy solution right unless you have the diagnosis right. So that's where I'm going to focus this morning. Do we have some slides, I hope? There we go. Um, so I, I wanted to start for a minute with sort of what MassDOT and the MBTA does. It seems self-evident, but there's a lot going on. And one of the things that I um, sometimes hear that disturbs me as we begin this uh, policy conversation about transportation and what to do about it is, um, you know, is there really any sense of urgency? Do those people do anything? Do they care about the T or the traffic? And the answer is, we've been real busy, and the reason that we're having the conversation that we're having at this point is that we have built a foundation over the last four years with the work of the MBTA and MassDOT, a foundation of work that now allows us to sort of press the accelerator and say, let's all get going faster uh, because the nature of the problems and their urgency can't wait. So this is my sort of checklist of things that we need to get uh, done right every single day. Um, it's a very multi-headed thing, transportation. There's a capital side to it. There's an operating side. I will tell you, and we'll talk about this a little bit when we talk about the congestion report, the um, manage roadway operations actively and safely is a new idea uh, and one that we're still trying to understand. Basically, one way that you can think about Mass Dot and the T is the T, like all transit agencies, has always been in the operating everyday business, not so much in the delivering capital projects business. Mass Dot has always been in the capital projects business, not so much in the operating the roads every day. So, with the T, we're focusing on capital delivery. With Mass Dot, we're focusing on managing our congested roadways in a way that we've really never tried before. Um, both agencies have a ton of assets which have been underinvested in not for years but for decades and that is why we have such a large deferred maintenance backlog. And while you might think that talking about the condition of assets is a separate issue from talking about um, congestion and reliability, it's the same thing. If we do not have either the T's uh, trains and tracks and signal and power or our roads and bridges in good operating condition, in good asset condition, then uh, it makes our transportation system unreliable um, and we need to make those investments. And we have, you know, thousands of lane miles. I would also note that most people kind of this is a surprise. MassDOT owns roughly the same amount of train tracks um, as the T does because uh, we operate, we own and operate the freight train network and the passenger train network in uh, Western Massachusetts. And every year, these are just our numbers from uh, the last state fiscal year, every year we pave enough um, roadway to go from one end of the state to the other twice over and we put in, we upgrade and modernize uh, hundreds of traffic signals and we add sidewalks and we do uh, l fix bridges. Um, and similarly, the T, um, these are just some T statistics. The T owns tracks and signals and power systems and fleets of buses and light rail vehicles and heavy rail vehicles and commuter rail trains. And part of what we've been doing these past years to lay that foundation for taking it to the next level is just understanding the condition of these assets, putting asset management systems in place, um, and, and building, as I'll talk about this morning, both a capital plan and now a bond bill that uh, Governor Baker filed in August on the basis of that knowledge. And um, one of the things I say all the time is a list of projects that you're building is not actually a capital investment strategy. Um, and a bunch of earmarks in a bond bill is not a transportation uh, policy. Um, we have already transformed our capital plan into a true transportation investment strategic portfolio, and it is my hope as we engage with our colleagues in the legislature, 
on the bond bill that will continue to take that strategic approach. And sometimes you may hear from folks, we need a plan. There is no plan in Massachusetts. We need a plan. No, we actually have plans, many plans. Um, there will never be one plan that can describe every aspect of the transportation system in every corner of the Commonwealth. So we have, over the last four years, done a series of statewide plans for walking, bicycling, freight, um, rail, uh, the MBTA. We also do a lot of planning in places where congestion is. So in Kendall Square, in the seaport, we've done a transit action plan for Everett. We're in the middle of doing one for Lynn, out on the Cape, where it's not just enough to rebuild the Sagamore and Bourne bridges. We need to think about the approaches to those bridges and how they relate to the Cape's economy. In the Berkshires, where we've been looking at the idea of a Pittsfield to New York City train. So um, if people say to you, oh, we need a plan, we don't have a plan, that's why we're not fixing transportation in this state. Planning is not the problem. It's getting to an agreement on what, what of those things we should implement. Because as you're gonna hear this morning, um, no matter how much money in the end we decide we want to invest in transportation, you still have to prioritize it. You cannot do everything at the same time, and you have to have a strategic approach, and you have to do the most important things first, and less important things need to wait. So. As part of our planning, we also had a great group of um, individuals, not, I would say, the usual transportation um, folks that Governor Baker pulled together for all of 2018 and for a commission on the future of transportation. The report's on the web. It's fascinating. They looked at how do autonomous vehicles change how we think about transportation investment? Where does land use fit in? What about electrification and decarbonization of the system? So we really have some great blueprints that we can move ahead on as we address what I would argue to you this morning are the two big challenges that the transportation system faces. And I'm actually not going to start with congestion, which I know everyone wants to talk about and we will, but I'm going to start with climate change because we're coming off the week in which the United Nations has been grappling with this issue and many people who are otherwise very sincere and up to speed on climate change do not realize that transportation sector greenhouse gas emissions are at this point both the largest and the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions. In Massachusetts, we've actually done a great job of taking that red at the top, which is our electric generating sector, taking those emissions down. But if you look at the bottom of the slide and you look at the green, which is transportation, the good news, I guess, is they've kind of held steady, but they've actually just become a bigger and bigger proportion of the transportation pie to the point where it's approaching half of all of our greenhouse gas emissions. Because unlike when it comes to buildings and the electric generating sector, we haven't had a game plan for what we are going to do about it. But we have a game plan now, and a critical part of it is something called the Transportation and Climate Initiative, which is a multi-state initiative from Maine to Virginia uh, that we announced all the states issued a joint proclamation in December about moving forward throughout 2019 to come up with what's called a cap and invest program. It works like the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which many of you may be familiar with, you, um, you, you basically have to buy an allowance uh, at the wholesale transportation fuels level um, in order to be able to do it. You can price the allowances, you can sort of turn down the cap in order to slowly bring transportation greenhouse gas emissions down. Uh, those allowances are bought and sold. One of the questions we're wrestling with is do we want allowances that are bought and sold under the electric one, the REGI, to, to interact with the ones from the transportation side? They're then auctioned off uh, and when, and when you, the auction proceeds come back to Massachusetts, so it's a regional thing, um, but Massachusetts keeps its own money and can then invest that money in public transit. So what I would say to you about TCI, as we call it, it, it was not proposed to be a revenue source. It was proposed because it is a proven mechanism that has worked in the electric sector, um, and it is our best bet for starting to make a, a significant dent in transportation greenhouse gas emissions. It was proposed because it makes sense to act regionally. We are a state where in large parts of this state, if we increase the cost of gas at the pump, people can go to Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut, Rhode Island, or New York to buy their gasoline, which will not help us either with revenue or with miles traveled and air pollution from cars. So if we act as a region, yes, the impact of TCI and a cap and invest will be an increase and the cost of gas at the pump, but is very different than a gas tax, and we think it is a smarter solution. 
focused on transportation and greenhouse gas emissions, but as I'll talk about later, one that does have the wonderful secondary benefit of producing some revenue that we can use to invest in our system. So big challenge number one, climate. Big challenge number two, congestion. As I said, when we came out with the congestion report, at some level, it wasn't a surprise to people, but I think we learned some things that are important for all of us to think about as we move forward to try to answer the question, what are we going to do about all that congestion out there? So these are the 10 findings of the report. One of the things that is clear is um, it, transportation, uh, congestion has gotten much worse because the state is doing great. And everyone in this room wants the state to keep doing great. We have more people living here. We have more people working here. We have more companies hiring here. And that puts more cars on the road. And none of us would want to see an economic slowdown as the solution to congestion. But I think the thing that we really learned from the report is what is the mechanism by which all of those people and workers use a system that has never, let's be honest, we've all sat in traffic the whole time we've lived here. But how come it feels like it's so much worse? What's going on? And what the report ends up saying, if I were going to boil it down to one thing, is all the extra people in job. Massachusetts, if you did not know this, has been the fastest growing state in the Northeast United States since the 2010 census. Faster than New Hampshire, faster than New York. So all those people sort of increase the amount of people using basically the same roads, because we're kind of a, you know, we're a 400-year-old state. We're not, not a lot of room to build new roads. And they fill up. Once those roads are filled up, that's called recurring congestion. Anything that goes wrong, right, sends the whole system into sort of a tailspin, and then you're stuck in traffic. That could be solar glare. It could be a crash. It could be one of the companies that's out there doing that paving and fixing the roads kind of stays on the road too, too long, or a hole opens up in a bridge deck in the middle of the working day, um, or two people get in a crash and they exchange papers in the middle of the road instead of moving over to the side. But when that happens, it is hard to recover, and we basically lose the entire um, rush hour, right, to, to the backup. So the other thing that's going on is people are traveling all day long. So this is a chart of the hour by hour, all of the roadways, major roadways, not the local roads, uh, we don't have data for those, inside 128, and the percentage of those roads that are either badly congested, which is red, or congested, which is yellow. And what you see is, for a significant part of the day, up to half of every mile of roadway inside 128 is congested. And it's congested not, you know, from 8 to 9, but it is congested from 5 to 7, right? So that, that's why we say we're at a tipping point, because we're full, and then you get this, you get these incidents, and, and what's actually happening, so we looked first at average travel times. And, and the shocking thing was actually that average travel times haven't gone up that much. I mean, they've gone up, but not by enough to kind of explain everyone's like deep frustration with congestion, right? <laughs> so I felt that putting out a report that said, congestion, it's not as bad as you thought, was probably a political mistake. <laughs> so we wanted to, you know, and I'm a data-driven person, but when the data says one thing and people's lived experiences says another, you can't ignore anything. So, so we sort of poked at this issue, and, and sometimes averages hide what's actually going on, right? Because you're averaging two unlike things together. And that's what happens, because the truth is, as it says on the right, we always measure traffic conditions as if it's a straight line, as it's the same every day, but we experience traffic conditions with all these spikes. I, I have invented the following technical terms. Good days and bad days, okay? We, have, we all know this, right? There's the good day, you kind of leave the same time you usually do, you actually are in early enough to like grab an extra cup of coffee, and then there's the bad days. The way the system appears to have become congested is, is that the proportion of bad days has just gotten higher and higher and higher. And what actually happens in life is when there are enough of those bad days, right, you have to plan your life as if any day could be that day. So these are um, what are called histograms, for those of you who are data junkies. The blue and the um, purple charts, the top is uh, commuting from Framingham into Boston on the pike, the bottom chart is getting from Brockton up to Boston. It is literally, if you drew on a chart every single day, how many minutes that trip took for a whole year. And, and what you can see is that the average, right, could be 40 minutes, but 
If one day in five or one day in 10, it's taking you 60 or 70 minutes, and that's getting more and more frequent. It used to take you an hour, but only once a month. Then it took you an hour once a week. Then it took you an hour twice a week. In reality, what happens is you now have an hour commute every day, even though eight days in 10, you can get there in less than an hour, but you have to plan your life as those an hour commute. You have to leave in time, right? That's why everybody feels worse, because it's gotten to this tipping point where we now have to treat the bad day, whether you call that the one in five or the one in 10 number, as the actual commute length, and that is much longer than, than the average. So that's kind of what, when we dissected it and put it back, and the reason that's important is it then leads us to say what we do is very different than if there were, if the cause of congestion was, you know, our roads are too small, then the answer is you build roads. This list of things that are the recommendations in the report is not a menu that we are going to order from. This is, we have to do everything on this list every day and well, because that's how serious the congestion problem has become. Right, so we have to, I'll talk about bottlenecks for a minute, management. The T and transit is a big part of it, okay? We need the T to be good and reliable, not because everyone is gonna get on transit, but because when enough people use transit, two things are true. One is, at least they now have a reliable way of getting to work, right? And the other thing is, if we could take some of the edge out of those peaks, right? then we could get back to a more reasonable proportion of good days to bad days, right? And transit also becomes your backup on the bad days, even if you're a regular car commuter, if, if there's gonna be a storm, if whatever. So all of these are gonna be things we're gonna be doing. I'm not gonna talk about every single one because I wanna spend some time talking about uh, the bond bill and the capital budget and I wanna leave some time for questions, but one of the things the, 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 uh, the report does say is we are not opposed to big capital projects but do not count on them to fix your commute any time in the near future. Um, we spent 15 years and $400 million adding 13 miles to one lane of Route 128 in each direction. One of the reasons people always say to me, well, there's all, there's all that green in the middle. Couldn't that all just be paved and couldn't we drive on it? So what I tell people is look at the bridge abutments. That's that big hunk of concrete the bridge sits on. They're in the way of turning that into a lane. We had to rebuild 19 bridges in order to extend one lane on Route 20, 128 for less than 14 miles. That is not atypical. So this is not a philosophical, like I believe in building my way out of congestion or I don't. This is a very pragmatic, like no one wants to wait 14 years. And by the way, while we're building it, congestion's not great. So, but there are other things you can do. So we've been designing a fix for the Middleborough Rotary for as long as I've been secretary. It's gone from a $35 million project to a $65 million project to an $80 million project to a $100 million project. We're still designing it. But in 2017, some of my designers came up with an interesting idea for making less than $2 million worth of changes to striping and the angles of the approaches and we threw the project out for bid. It's, it was all done in less than a year and travel speeds through the rotary are now between 22 and 35 miles an hour, which is really interesting because the speed limit's 25 miles an hour. <laughs> Another thing that I would be remiss if I did not mention is, is that in that list of recommendations I went through with you, it doesn't just talk about transportation fixes because transportation is the symptom, it's not the cause. Travel is the thing that you do when you go from home to work, which means if we're serious about congestion, we need to think about home and work, not just the road or the train line in between them. Um, AIM and many of you in this room have been strong supporters of our housing production bill and for that I thank you. That is part of the solution to transportation. People's inability to find a reasonably affordable place to live near their job is driving people to farther and farther commutes which become longer and longer commutes which affect not only that household but the rest of us. Housing is part of the answer to congestion. Another thing that's an interesting part of the answer is not going to work. Okay, we live in an era where for some workers, sometimes you can work from home, you can work from a remote center. Startlingly, we are not a national leader in the proportion of people who work from home. You would think we would be in Massachusetts in the Bay Area. If tomorrow, the same number of people worked remotely uh, in the greater Boston area as, as, as happens in the Bay Area in San Francisco, which is about the same size workforce, 
Tomorrow, there would be 40,000 fewer drivers on the roads at peak times because they have 40,000 more um, remote workers than we do in their workforce. And that's something people in this room can help us with. Um, another thing I want to point out, um, ignore it says September 27th, I wouldn't be showing you that was true. October 11th is the deadline. We want employers to collaborate with their local regional transit authority, with their transportation management authority. Tell us we're missing a shuttle bus. We want to try this idea. We want to work with Uber and Lyft. We want to band together with three other companies and figure out how to help get our workers to our jobs, but in vehicles that have more than one person, right? So this is our new uh, Workforce Transportation Grants Program. It is very flexible. Uh, you can go on the web and look for more information. Anyone can apply. The, impl the applicant can be the employer, can be the city or town, can be the transit authority. Uh, we extended it to October 11th because we want to get lots of great proposals, so please take a look. The last thing I want to talk about before I turn to our investment portfolio and, and leave a couple minutes for questions is people have talked about congestion pricing. The report has an entire chapter on congestion pricing. It can be an important tool in the toolkit. It is not a silver bullet solution. One of the most fundamental reasons that that is true is because people think, well, we will just hijack our tolls and we will turn them into congestion pricing collection mechanisms. Here's the bad news. The tolls are often where there is no congestion, and where there is congestion, there are frequently no tolls. They were not built to be a congestion pricing system. They were built to collect revenue on specific pieces of the roadway network when bonds had to be issued for building. If we want to build a congestion pricing network, we need to build a congestion pricing network, not use our tolls and call them congestion pricing. Similarly, one congestion pricing idea that is talked about in the report and that is the report is not optimistic about is this idea of time of day. What if we changed the pricing at the time of day? That can work if there is a time to shift it into. But this is, a this is speed and volume on the Tobin Bridge, okay? It doesn't hit the speed limit any time during the day. So unless we're going to define off-peak as between midnight and 4 o'clock in the morning, um, there's not a lot of time shifting. And the reason for this, right, if you go back to my narrative, what is congestion, people have already peak shifted them. We are not stupid and we do not need a dime off the price of our toll to know that it's better to commute at 6 in the morning than it is to commute at 8 in the morning. So people who can have, and one of the things that we're very concerned about from an equity perspective is many of the people who are in bad congestion at peak hours are there because that is the only choice they have, not because they enjoy that. Um, and if that is the only choice, then pricing that simply punishes people who have no options. It does not actually change travel behavior. And we are not in the punishing people who have no options business. So very quickly, another thing we focused on is building a capital plan, building an investment portfolio, spending money to fix things. Our current five-year capital plan totals $18.3 billion. I know that some people think that that is not enough money. It is not change under the cushions, $18.3 billion. We've got tons of projects in there. This is our national highway system. Um, one of the things that we have done is use our asset management. So we do not pick numbers out of hats when we decide how much money should we be spending. Um, these are actually two scenarios. The top line is pavement that's in good shape, not on the interstates, but on major road. The bottom line is pavement that's in poor shape. Our goal is to keep the percentage of pavement that's in good shape up, right, and to decrease the pavement. One line is what would have been, happened over the next 10 years at the rate we were spending. The other line is what would happen over the next 10 years if we upped the spending a bit. We presented this analysis to the governor and to the administration and finance secretariat, and they upped the amount of money we had to spend on pavement to the scenario in which we actually achieve our targets over the next 10 years. We should and will have a conversation about do we need more resources to achieve our goals? We just need to be clear on what our goals are and whether we've already found those because it, we have been looking hard and we have been adding resources. Um, I want to talk for a minute about the T. A huge amount of work is going into the T. This is the T's capital spending. The good news is it's, it's nearly doubled from sort of down in the 400 million a year range to up in the 800 million a year range. The blue is kind of core system investment. The green is expansion projects like the Green Line Extension and South Coast Rail. We're doing both. 
So you can see that in the next five years, we've set aside $9 billion. In the previous five, we spent under four. So we're doubling the amount that the T is investing with resources we already have. No new revenue needed, okay? Um, what that will produce is by 2023, a red line where trains come along every three minutes. It's not just about buying the new cars. It's fixing the signals and the track and the powers and the bridges and, the, and building the maintenance facility to be big enough to accommodate all the new cars in the fleet. We will have an orange line by the end of 2022 that comes along every four and a half minutes instead of every seven or eight. And that is not a, like if we had resources. Every penny of those, that, that, that's $2 billion I just described to you. Not only is every penny available, every contract for all of that work is already out and the work is underway. Um, we're now doing the same thing on the green line. What would it take? What would the fleet look like? And there's money in the bond bill to, to do the green line transformation program. Um, we're working on the buses. Um, every day, MBTA buses carry three times as many people as all 14 commuter rail lines put together. You want to make an impact, we need to focus on buses. They may not be as sexy, but that's what moves people. So we're doing a ton on buses and then uh, a ton on commuter rail. And, and it's showing. We're seeing uh, commuter rail performance improve. We're seeing more people taking commuter rail. Just last week, we announced we're buying more two-level coaches that seat more people. We're going to try to replace every single level coach in the fleet with two-level coach so that we can carry more people. It's still not good enough. We need to accelerate capital delivery. Um, one of the things that I want to, the T needs to get to a billion and a half a year and then spend it every year from now until 2032 and then we will have a fully modernized uh, transit system. That is possible, not easy. And the one message that I would want you to take away from today is it's not just about money. Don't get me wrong, money matters. But there's at least four things that have to happen at the same time if we want the T to succeed in that level of investment. One is they need to have the people on board. The T is an organization of 6,600 people. They need to hire 1,000 people this year, okay, to, to do what they've done. They have the money in their budget to hire those 1,000 people. You try hiring those 1,000 people, many of them in construction in a 2.9% unemployment economy. Um, we need to fix the toolkit that the T has to procure, and MassDOT, to procure and deliver projects. All of the language we need to do that is actually in outside sections of the bond bill the governor filed. We need that bill to pass, not just for the money, but for the, the thing. We do need capital resources, but right now, as I said, we got 18 billion in the, in the capital plan and more on the way if we pass the bond bill. But finally, we have to have an honest conversation, and I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but we do have to have an honest conversation about how much pain we are willing to experience. Because if we try to do everything at the same time, then everywhere you go, you will encounter work, and pieces of the T will be closed, and roads will be closed. So we have literally been creating heat maps of all the projects, ours, private ones, municipal ones, utility ones, T, and trying to understand where the, the little amoeba things are. That's like where projects overlap. And the truth is, if I have to fix the Sumner Tunnel, if you gave me money tomorrow to fix the Sumner Tunnel, I would not fix the Sumner Tunnel tomorrow. Because fixing the Sumner Tunnel while the Tobin is closed is a really stupid idea. <laughs> because the MBTA needs to fix the blue line tunnel between Aquarium and Maverick, and they need to do that first. They're gonna do it next year because we've gone through the sequencing exercise, because we cannot close the blue line while the Sumner Tunnel is under construction, okay? So when people say, do you not feel a sense of urgency? Why aren't you doing something about all this stuff? What I say is we're doing a ton. It may not be visible to you yet, but this is what we've actually been doing. Understand what's causing congestion. Understand how we attack it in a way that also addresses our climate change issues. Figure out what work we need to be done. Do the asset management work. Write the plans. Sequence everything. This is why I am confident as I stand in front of you in 2019 that we, are, we have laid those foundations for hitting the accelerator and getting the work done. And that is why when the governor filed the transportation bond bill, we called it an act authorizing and accelerating transportation investment. It's not just a bond bill. It's not, it's got a lot of important information, a lot of tools in it. And the other thing I would say is, um, and this is kind of where I'll close. People say to me, okay, but if you have 18 billion in the CIP and you have another, you know, three, four, five billion 
oh wait, it's a $17 billion capital uh, bond bill. Is, is there any money missing? And what I would say to you is we have gone through that exercise internally, category by category. We need more money for resiliency. We will never pay to make climate resilient our entire existing transportation infrastructure out of existing sources. That's why the governor proposed one approach to creating a resiliency fund. The speaker proposed a different one. We're open to a conversation, but the resiliency problem will not be solved by pouring more money into the existing transportation infrastructure funding sources. It needs its own source. On roads and bridges, we identified using our asset management that our biggest problem is where cities and towns own these big arterials, these state numbered roads, and we put more money for that into the bond bill. We acknowledge that we have just finished an eight year, $3 billion accelerated bridge program, and we need to spend more money on bridges. We need to ramp up by about $200 million a year on bridge spending. The bond bill has a proposal to use grant anticipation notes, basically bonding against future revenue. It's how we paid for the last $3 billion bridge program, but that one expired. We need to reauthorize it. Um, we need to figure out how to pay for the Austin Multimodal Program, but first we actually have to design it and know what it's gonna cost. So those of you who are worried about that, no, we do not know how we're going to pay for it. No, we do not know what it costs. Um, and then the MBTA has more money, honest to God, more money than it can spend between now and about 2025. But even in the bond bill, we begin to lay the groundwork. And one of the ways we do this, and this is where I will close with how all the pieces fit together, once the Transportation Climate Initiative is up and running, it will produce hundreds of millions of dollars a year. But in transportation, sadly, that's not that much money. Um, that's why mostly we bond, because that turns millions into billions, okay? So the bond bill proposes, and we are the only state in the TCI region that has said this, that we actually take up to half the revenue from TCI and we bond against it to create a substantial new source of money on top of all the other sources of money that will actually ramp up just as the T gets to the point where it can spend at the billion and a half it's gone through its eight or nine billion dollars that it already has. So it's not just where I'm saying, don't worry, we've got the next five years. We are thinking ahead and we think we've identified that combination of the grant anticipation notes for the bridges, the resiliency fund, and the use of the TCI proceeds. We think that's the right revenue com combination. Now we know there's gonna be a conversation about this and we welcome that conversation, but what I would say to you is, and I'm not gonna go through all this, but I'm happy to give John a copy of the full presentation. As we have that conversation, let's at least make sure we're all working towards the right things. And what we propose is that those are four things. The system has to be reliable. Even if your commute's five minutes longer, as long as it's roughly the same length every day, we can all work, live our lives. The system has to create accessibility and specifically access to jobs, access to Good jobs from affordable homes in a reasonable period of time, say 45 minutes, should be our metric. And every time we propose a solution, we should say, will that help that? And building housing can do that, and creating jobs in the right places can do that, and fixing transit, all those things can do that. The third thing is sustainability. Congestion relief that actually makes greenhouse gases go up is unacceptable in the year 2019. And finally, the system has to work for everyone. And yes, that means people of every economic class and that means people of every ability, but it's also a state of 351 cities and towns and even while we focus on Greater Boston and the T, we need to have options for people of all types. People who um, live in urban areas and people who live in suburbs and people who live in small towns, people who can stay home or shift their travel time and people who cannot work from home or shift their travel time. People who want to use transit or walk or bike and people who would actually like the option of driving. That's what we've been focused on. That's what I know many in the, of you in this room are thinking about and that's what we welcome the conversation on. Thank you for listening.